Hey, how's it going? My name is Leon. So about a year or so ago, I was on YouTube and I happened upon a video by the YouTuber Chronicles of Judah 144. This video was a commentary that he did where he went through a CBS News um, morning segment that mentioned that basically the FBI had released a document concerning Dr. Martin Luther King. And the document was actually uh, re reviewed by the FBI and JFK Task Force on May 8, 1994. But the actual investigation itself by the FBI was subject to called um, Martin Luther King Jr. A Current Analysis, dated March 12, 1968. So what I wanted to do is that I wanted to actually share this with you all. I'm going to link the video um from Chronicles of Juno 144 in the description box. But I'm gonna also link this particular article, um, this document as a PDF. Uh, and what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually read the entire document. Um, and how I'm gonna do the video is that basically, as I read each section, I'm gonna screenshot the section I'm reading so everybody can follow along. But really the whole point of this is that for those that really don't have time to actually read everything, this is basically an, an audio version of the of the actual document the fbi document i'm about to read is broken up into six different parts i'm going to put time stamps on each part so for those that want to continue reading or only want to hear about specific topics they're able to do so so part one is an introduction part two is the formation of southern christian leadership conference part three is going to be communist objectives part four is the emergence of the peace issue in king's group Part five is Southern Christian Leadership Conference finances. And part six is going to be King's personal conduct. Section one, introduction. Since 1956, Martin Luther King Jr. has occupied a prominent role in the drive for equal rights for Negroes in the United States. During this critical period in our nation's history, much has depended on him as the individual Negroes and in great numbers have looked to for leadership and their drive to achieve equality. Much depends on him still in these times when racial tensions have created an atmosphere of fear and foreboding among many Negroes and whites alike. The course King ch chooses to follow at this crucial time could have momentous impact on the future of race relations in the United States. And for that reason, this paper has been prepared to give some insight into the nature of the man himself, as well as the nature of his views, goals, objectives, tactics, and the reasons thereof. Subtitle, Washington Spring Project. Martin Luther King Jr., president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC, has stated publicly that he, he and 3,000 of his followers will march on Washington, D.C. this spring. He has announced that he will lead a massive civil disobedience campaign that will disrupt the normal course of business and, in fact, close down the nation's capital. He originally announced his project on August 15, 1967 in Atlanta, Georgia, on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the SCLC. King, King predicted that this massive civil disobedience will be more effective than riots. Concerning civil disobedience, King declares, to dislocate the function of a city without destroying it can be more effective than a riot because it can be longer lasting, costly to society, but not one timely destructive. King has referred to this campaign as the Washington Spring Project and the Poor People's March, which is reportedly being staged to pressure Congress into passing legislation favorable to the Negro. It is King's contention that the government of the United States does not move until it is confronted dramatically. To add to this dramatic confrontation, King has boasted he and his entourage are coming to Washington to stay, that his followers still conduct sit-ins, camp-ins, and sleep-ins at every government facility available, including the lawn of the White House. He has bragged that he will fill up the jails of Washington and the surrounding towns. Subtitle, Black Nationalist Terror. One serious danger in the confrontation lies in the proposed action of the black nationalist groups, which plan to attempt to seize the initiative and escalate the nonviolence demonstrations into violence. King has met with black nationalists and attempts Tempted to solicit their support, Stokely Carmichael of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, an extremist black nationalist organization, has conferred with King.
Carmichael endorses the objectives of King and advises he will not oppose or interfere with the Washington Spring Project's plan for nonviolence. However, he also states his role will be governed by what SNCC decides. King is aware of the possibility of violence because one of his aides proclaimed recently to the press, jail would be the safest place in Washington this spring. However, in spite of this potentially explosive situation, King continues his plans. He adroitly uses this possibility as a lever to attempt to pressure Congress into action by warning that the Washington Spring Project may be the last chance in this country for peaceful change with respect to civil rights needs. Subtitle Strong Communist Influence Another complicating factor in the picture is the degree of communist influence on King. One of King's principal advisors is Stanley David Levinson. Ostensibly only a New York City attorney and businessman, Levinson is in fact a shrewd, dedicated communist. Levinson has spent the, ma the major part of his life advancing communist interests. Levinson gravitated to Martin Luther King Jr. in 1956. He has been as dedicated in his support of King as he has been in advancing communist goals. He has actively involved himself in fundraising drives for King served as his legal counsel and certain matters suggested speech material for him discussed with king demonstrations in which king was involved guided him in regard to acceptance or rejection of various public appearances and speaking commitments and helped him with matters related to articles and books king has prepared levinson edited most of the chapters of king's new book entitled where do we go from here chaos or community levinson wrote one chapter of this book and the publisher's representative complained to King and Levinson that it was obvious certain sections of the book were written by different individuals. Stanley Levinson has told Clarence Jones, another advisor to King, that under no circumstances should King be permitted to say anything without their approving it. Levinson also informed Jones that King is such a slow thinker, he is usually not prepared to make statements without help from someone. Levison is actively participating in the planning of King's Washington Spring Project. Subtitle Explosive Situation The combined forces of the communist influence and the black nationalists advocating violence give the Washington Spring Project a potential for an extremely explosive situation. This is the end of Section 1. Section 2 Formation of Southern Christian Leadership Conference Subsection Background of Founder Martin Luther King Jr. was born January 15, 1929, at Atlanta, Georgia. His name at birth was Michael Luther King Jr. In 1935, his first name was changed to Martin. King received an A.B. degree in 1948 from Morehouse College, Atlanta, Georgia. He then entered Crozier Theological Seminary, Chester, Pennsylvania, where he was one of six Negroes among 100 students. He won the Plathcro Award as the most outstanding student was president of the senior class and received the J. Lewis Crozier Fellowship for graduate study at the university of his choice. King graduated from the Crozier Theological Seminary with a Bachelor's of Divinity degree in 1951 and did graduate work at Boston University, Boston, Massachusetts, where he secured a PhD degree in 1955. Upon graduation, he was offered the pastorate of two Baptist churches in the East and teaching posts in three colleges. King chose to pastorate at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. After becoming established in his church, he founded the Montgomery Improvement Association and led local Negroes in the Montgomery bus boycott that attracted national attention. In March of 1957, he founded the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC, with himself as president. He still holds that position today. He is also co-pastor of the Ebenezer Baptist Church, Atlanta, Georgia. Subsection Subversives Attracted Stanley Levison was attracted to King in the SCLC when King gained national attention. Levison soon developed a close relationship with King and was known in King's group as assistant chief. In 1961, he was assistant treasurer of SCLC. Prior to joining forces with King, Levinson led a double life in the Communist Party USA, CPUSA. Hourly, he was a su successful businessman, 
but he was also the clandestine fundraiser of the CPUSA. He was entrusted with raising and handling secret funds for the party and used some of these funds to finance his own activities. Through Levison's influence, other subversives were attracted to SCLC. Hunter Pitts O'Dell, former National Committee member of the CPUSA, was employed by SCLC. In 1962, when King mentioned to Levison that he was thinking of adding an administrative assistant to his staff, Levison recommended O'Dell, who was then head of SCLC's New York office. King said he liked the idea. At the time, King was well aware of Levinson and O'Dell's communist affiliations. The reason King enjoyed this close relationship with communists is best explained by the fact that Levinson in February 1962 passed the word to Gus Hall, General Secretary, CPUSA. King is a wholehearted Marxist who has studied it, Marxism, believes in it, and agrees with it, but because of his being a minister of religion, does not dare to espouse it publicly. Further, in March 1962, Levison told a CPUSA functionary that King was concerned about a communist label being pinned on us, but that at the same time, he wanted to do everything possible to evidence friendship towards the Soviet Union. In addition, King has been described within the CPUSA as a true, genuine Marxist-Leninist from the top of his head to the tips of his toes. The feeling within the CPUSA at that time was, and still is, that King definitely follows a Marxist-Leninist line. Subsection, Communists Exposed. King was forced to get rid of Hunter Pitts Odell in October 1962 when several newspaper articles exposed Odell's connection with SCLC and his communist affiliations. King still tried to hide Odell and his organization until July 1963 when he accepted Odell's resignation. As King put it, Odell's release was not because of connections between Odell and the CPUSA, but because of the emotional public response. Odell has continued his efforts to make his presence felt in the civil rights movement in behalf of the CPUSA. The winter 1967 issue of Freedom Ways, self-described as a review of the Negro freedom movement, lists Odell as associate managing editor. Actually, Freedom Ways is a CPUSA initiated and CPUSA supported publication espousing the, the communist viewpoint of Negro problems. Subsection King Speaks at Rally Honoring Communists On February 23, 1968, King was the guest speaker at a rally of more than 1,000 people at Carnegie Hall, New York City. Sponsored by Freedom Ways, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the birth of W.E.B. Du Bois, famous Negro civil rights crusader who joined the Communist Party at age 93. Jack O'Dell, the popular name used by Hunter Pitts O'Dell, was also listed as one of the speakers at this affair. On the following day, Stanley Levison confided to Clarence Jones that King performed very badly at the Freedom Ways rally. He commented, King has never read anything as badly and as though he did not understand what he was reading. Subsection, former communist advisors. Bayard Rustin is a former advisor to King and a one-time assistant secretary of the SCLC. Rustin has publicly admitted affiliation with the communist movement in the late 1930s. He was also one of a selected number of observers permitted to attend the CPUSA's National Convention in 1957. King said he had to let Rustin go because of problems arising from his homosexual activities. Rustin has long been so inclined, having been arrested in New York City in 1946 for offering to commit a lewd or indecent act. Rustin was arrested again in Pasadena, California in 1953 for offering to engage in an act of sex perversion of a homosexual nature, which he admitted and for which he was sentenced to serve 60 days. Subsection Advisory Committee Established for King On June 22, 1964, an advisory and research committee was formed with King's approval for the purpose of writing King's speeches and guiding his actions. Among the members of this group were Lawrence Reddick, Bayard Rustin, Clarence Jones, and Harry Wachtel. Reddick is a former member of the CPUSA. On March 5, 1944, Wachtel's name was on a list of names whose significance is not known, 
maintained at the headquarters of the Kings County Communist Party, New York. On the same date, records at this headquarters contained the name of Wachtel's wife, Leonora, on a list of newly elected officers of the Bath Beach Club of the Kings County Communist Party, New York. In addition to being on the advisory committee, Clarence Jones, a Negro attorney, is also general counsel to the Gandhi Society for Human Rights, a fundraising adjunct of the SCLC. Prior to October 1966, King attempted to hide his association with Stanley Levinson and used Jones as the intermediary. During the mid-1950s, Jones held a position of leadership in the Labor Youth League, an organization which has been designated as subversive pursuant to Executive Order 10450. Clarence Jones married Anne Aston Water Norton on June 3, 1956. She is the daughter of the deceased publisher William H. Norton. Between 1947 and 1950, she was identified as a Communist Party club member at Sarah Lawrence College. In the early 1950s, she was also active in the Labor Youth League. On April 5, 1955, she was observed as a driver of a station wagon, which was used to transport Communist Party underground leaders in connection with an official Communist Party meeting. In 1956, she was described by a self-admitted communist as a hardcore communist. Subsection King wins Nobel Peace Prize. In October 1964, it was announced that King, a 35-year-old Baptist minister, was being awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. On November 24, 1964, King contacted Jones and asked that Jones and Levinson, among others, submit five-minute speeches which King could use in accepting the Nobel Peace Prize. King will select the best material from these speeches. Subsection King's Attraction for Communist Advisors Two previous aides of King were Cordy T. Vivian, who formerly served as director of affiliates of the SCLC, and Randolph Blackwell, who at one time acted as SCLC program coordinator. Both of these individuals are former members of the CPUSA. During the early stages of development and formation of the SCLC, the following eight individuals helped shape and mold the policies of this organization and is noted all have communist affiliations. Stanley David Levinson, title Assistant Chief. Clarence Jones, title Advisory Committee. Harry Wagtail, title Advisory Committee. Cordy T. Vivian, title Director of Affiliates. Randolph Blackwell, title Program Coordinator. Hunter Pitts O'Dell, title Administrative Assistant. Lawrence Reddick, Title, Advisory Committee. Bayard Rustin, Title, Advisory Committee. Of these, Levinson, Jones, and Wagtail continue to exert strong influence on King in the SCLC. In addition, at the 10th anniversary convention of SCLC at Atlanta, Georgia, on August 14, 1967, a brochure listed L.D. Reddick as historian of SCLC. And this is the end of Section 2. Section 3, Communist Objectives. During the early 1960s, the CPUSA was striving to obtain a Negro labor coalition to achieve its goals in this country. At that time, the CPUSA party line was, big business attacks on the rights of labor are continuing. In order to defeat this offensive, organized labor, assisted by communists, must launch a counter crusade, which can succeed only if it is based on the united action of the entire trade union movement. Also, communists had recognized the error of their ways by proclaiming that the community program for self-determination of the Negro in the Black Belt area of the South had been discarded. The new policy was to seek complete economic, political, and social equality for the Negro with all other American citizens. In a May 1961 issue, the communist newspaper, The Worker, stated, Communists will do their utmost to strengthen and unite the Negro movement and bring it to the backing of the working people. Martin Luther King Jr. and his organization were made to order to achieve these objectives. King and his group were demonstrating and conducting voter registration campaigns to align the Negro movement solidly behind King. Subsection The Peace Issue Appears this activity continued with much fanfare until the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 by the Congress. This was the most far-reaching Civil Rights Act passed since the Reconstruction era. Now it was no longer newsworthy to demonstrate for Negro rights. The passage of this act 
was one factor that took King off the front pages of the daily newspapers. The second factor that had a bearing on King's lack of publicity and change of policy was the Gulf of Tonkin incident on August 2nd, 1964. Because of this, the United States took a more active role in the Vietnam War. The CPUSA then started to demand through its propaganda machine that the escalation of the war in Vietnam be stopped. The activities in Vietnam were now more important news than was the Negro Freedom Movement. The CPUSA also realized that even though the peace issue was of primary importance, a secondary issue not to be forgotten was the Freedom Movement, abandoning its previous efforts to form a Negro Labor Coalition. The CPUSA now started toting a Negro Peace Coalition that would form a massive movement to force the United States government to change its foreign and domestic policies. The worker in April 1965 claimed that this coalition was started, starting to form when it started. The civil rights movement was coming to see the identity of interest of the Negro people's freedom movement with the anti-imperial objectives of ending the neo-colonialist war of the United States against the people of Vietnam. And this is section three. Section 4. The Emergence of the Peace Issue in King's Group Subsection. Role as a Peacemaker King and his aides helped form this coalition of peace and freedom groups. They saw an opportunity to again propel King into the international spotlight by proposing he make peace in Vietnam. On August 12, 1965, King announced publicly that he would appeal personally to President Ho Chi Minh of North Vietnam to join a conference to end the Vietnam War. He said he would also send letters to leaders of, of South Vietnam, the Soviet Union, and the United States in this regard. This move on the part of King was engineered by Bayard Rust and Harry Wachtel. In early August, they met and discussed how to inject King into the Vietnam issue. It was decided to have King write these world leaders utilizing King's prestige as a winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. This action, they felt, would cast an image of King as a great moral leader and extend his influence beyond the civil rights movement. Subsequently, a leading newspaper sent King 12 questions to answer, which would clarify his position on Vietnam. Upon receipt of these questions, King referred them to Stanley Levison to answer. Because of the unfavorable public reaction to King's announcement, a conference with his top advisors was held in early September 1965, at which time it was decided that King would avoid the Vietnam issue. Bayard Rustin, Stanley Levison, Harry Wachtel, and Clarence Jones were in attendance at this conference. Subsection Admiration Laws In early 1966, King was lamenting to Harry Wachtel about a nationally known figure who at one time was a heavy contributor to and admirer of King but was displeased because of King's stand on Vietnam. Wachtel reminded King, When we went into this Vietnam thing, we decided that he who controls the purse strings doesn't control our philosophy. Subsection Continue Pressure by Press after the resumption of bombing of North Vietnam in February 1966, King conferred with Stanley Levison and Bayard Rustin concerning a statement for the press. King informed them that the press had been bothering him for a statement, but he dared not take any action until he discussed the matter with them. It was agreed that King would say he was deeply impressed by the large number of senators who called for a cessation of the bombing. Levinson reiterated that King should point out how much opposition there is to the bombing. Subsection Anti-Vietnam War Resolution Miami was the scene of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference Executive Board meeting in the spring 1966. During this two-day conference, the session ran into the early morning hours attempting to draft a resolution on the Vietnam War. While there appeared to be general agreement, Stanley Levinson and Harry Wachtel continued to argue for a stronger resolution then was presented. They wanted a resolution that would condemn participation by United States troops in Vietnam. The conference finally adopted a resolution calling on the government to desist aiding the military junta in Vietnam and to seriously consider a prompt withdrawal. Subsection Face the Nation in May 1966, King was extended an invitation to appear 
on the Columbia Broadcasting System program faced the nation. Prior to this appearance, King sought the advice of Stanley Levison and Clarence Jones. King wanted their thinking on the, the more important questions he might be asked. Levison noted the possibility that King might be questioned on the Vietnam War. Jones advised King to use the Southern Christian Leadership Conference resolution on Vietnam as his text. Levinson suggested that King should also point out how unfair it was that Negroes were shouldering a heavier burden in the war and that more Negroes were in combat than other Americans. When King appeared on the program, he suggested the United States stop bombing North Vietnam, negotiate with the Viet Cong, and recognize Red China. Subsection Senate Hearings Prior to his appearance before a Senate subcommittee hearing on urban affairs in December 1966, King contracted Levinson for counsel concerning his testimony. During this discussion, it was agreed that King must reiterate during his testimony that the war in Vietnam is standing in the way of the impl implementation of any of his civil rights projects and as an open invitation to confusion, chaos, disruptions, and riots. During his subsequent testimony before this committee, he spoke critically of the war in Vietnam along these lines. Subsection, the Nation Symposium. In late February 1967, King spoke before a symposium sponsored by The Nation magazine concerning the problems of redirecting American power. After this speech in which King was highly critical of United States involvement in Vietnam, Levinson congratulated him. Levison was pleased with the publicity King's speech received, commenting that King's appearance on a panel with four U.S. senators was the appropriate occasion for him to express his anti-war sentiments. Over the years, a number of individuals who had been employed at one time or another by the nation in editorial and writing capacities have been identified with the communist movement. Subsection Riverside Church Speech in early April 1967, King accepted an invitation to speak before the group, clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam. This is an interdenominational committee formed to mobilize religious opinion against the war. Prior to this speech, King and Andrew Young, executive director of SCLC, spent approximately eight hours in conference with King's top advisors in New York, New York. Stanley Levison and Henry Wachtill were present at this conference. Later that same day, King spoke at the Riverside Church, New York, New York, before this group, at which time he was highly critical of United States involvement in the Vietnam War. He referred to the United States government as the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. He proposed a five-step process to extricate the, the United States from this conflict. Comments in the news media coverage of King's remarks pointed out that the five points are similar in concept to the conditions imposed by North Vietnam as a prerequisite to negotiations. It is interesting to note that King's proposals parallel the propaganda lines which the Communist Party USA has been projecting regarding the war in Vietnam. Subsection Spring Mobilization At a conference in the fall of 1966 of the Peace Mobilization Committee, it was tentatively decided to hold massive peace demonstrations on April 15, 1967, in New York City and San Francisco, California. Of the 117 individuals in attendance, 75 were members of the Socialist Workers' Party or its youth group, the Young Socialist Alliance. The Communist Party was represented by Arnold Johnson and James West, both of whom are members of the Communist Party USA National Committee. This group subsequently changed its name to Spring Mobilization Committee to end the war in Vietnam. Reverend James Bavel, on leave from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, was appointed executive director of this committee. On April 13, 1967, Levinson and King were in contact to discuss the progress Levinson was making in the writing of the speech King was to deliver on April 15, 1967 to a rally of the Spring Mobilization Committee at the United Nations. Levinson discussed part of the speech which King enthusiastically accepted. King particularly liked the part indicating that the United States should unilaterally withdraw from Vietnam. He also enjoyed the part where he would appeal to the country to demand insistently that our government 
honor Hanoi's promise to negotiate if the bombings cease. The CPUSA was delighted with King's action in this regard. The recognized leader of 22 million Negroes had openly attacked this country's policy in Vietnam. He participated in the largest rally ever staged against the Vietnam War by being the keynote speaker. In his speech, King again called for the withdrawal of United States troops from Vietnam. King was helping the CPUSA achieve its goals of uniting the Negro movement with the peace issue. The worker expressed the CPUSA's pleasure in the May 7, 1967 issue where it stated in part, when Dr. King insists upon the connection between aggressive foreign policy and regressive domestic policy, he insists upon what is true and consequential. When Dr. King points to the racism comment and colonialism in Jim Crow, he points to which is historically demonstrable. When Dr. King affirms that the present war in Vietnam threatens all democratic and progressive advance, and the United States and does so for economic, political, ethical and psychological reasons. Again, he is saying what every fact and every day's events confirm. Hence, Dr. King, precisely as a leader in the struggle against Jim Crow, must be and is a leader in the struggle against war. Being the astute advisor he is and to keep King from being openly aligned with the CPUSA, Levison advised King to align himself with those individuals who have power rather than be aligned with the French anti-war element. He was to make the new alignment after his April 15, 1967 speech. Subsection King for President The French element Levison referred to was attempting to persuade King to run for president on a peace ticket. On April 19, 1967, Levison and Wachtill conferred concerning King's political possibilities. According to Wachtill, a pacifist group was meeting that day in an effort to get King to agree to run for president with Dr. Benjamin Spoke, the anti-war agitator, as his vice presidential candidate. Both Levinson and Wagtail agreed that it was too early and that King should not agree to run at this time. The CPUSA again seized the opportunity to cause dissension and unrest in the country by announcing they would support King and Spoke on a peace ticket. At a May Day 1967 program in Berkeley, California, Gus Hall stated the party forces should begin work right now to elect these two men because they are for peace in Vietnam. Early in May 1967, Levinson was still concerned with King's being identified with the peace movement rather than civil rights. When approached by peace groups attempting to get King to continue to run for president, Levinson informed those representatives that King would talk on Vietnam on occasion to various groups, but that would be the extent of his involvement. In an effort to evaluate his position, King and the SCLC held a retreat in Frogmore, South Carolina on May 21, 1967 to determine the relationship of the SCLC to the peace movement. King and other top functionaries concluded that the SCLC would give no overt or covert support to anti-Vietnam War demonstrations. Subsection The Birth of Washington Spring Project on July 19, 1967, Levinson was in conference with King concerning the Newark, New Jersey riot. Levinson indicated that he was concerned about King's failure to make any public statement concerning the racial disturbances. King informed Levinson that he had been considering making a statement but did not merely want to condemn the riots but also to condemn the conditions which led to riots. Levinson suggested that King advocate a program with dramatic quality similar to the Works Project Administration of the 1930s. This new program will be implemented by the federal government to employ the jobless youth. Levinson continued that this program worked in a period when the United States was almost bankrupt and should work even better now that the country is almost sick with money. King agreed that Levinson's idea had merit and he would publicly call upon the federal government to do something along this line. King waited until the 10th annual convention of the SCLC before he made these plans public. On August 15, 1967, he delivered an address at the convention urging new massive civil disobedience, which would include general strikes, school boycotts, and a camp in at Washington, D.C. All this would be to force Congress to take action to improve the lot of the Negro. This is the end of Section 4. Section 5, Southern Christian Leadership Conference Finances. 
The foremost problem in conducting such a campaign is making financial arrangements to handle the cost. As he had in the past, King turned to Levinson to help him handle this problem as well as all financing of the SCLC. At a retreat in September 1967, it was decided that SCLC would attempt to raise $1,500,000 during the coming year. It was contemplated that this money would be realized through the mail appeal program of SCLC under the general supervision of Levinson. Fiscal year July 1st, 1966 to June 30th, 1967, SCLC realized income in the amount of $901,021.52. The total expenses of SCLC for this period were $859,933.34. This indicated income exceeds expenses by $41,088.18. Subtitle, A Tax Dodge. The SCLC set up foundations to serve as tax exempt organizations that would solicit funds for SCLC. To this end, the American Foundation on Nonviolence of New York City and the Southern Christian Leadership Foundation of Chicago, Illinois were established. As money is needed by SCLC, Harry Wachtill, reportedly funnels the money from the American Foundation on Nonviolence to SCLC. Subtitle Funds from Firms and Foundations In February 1967, the firm of Merrill Lynch, Pierce, Fenner, and Smith, a stock brokerage firm, contributed $15,000 to SCLC. In August 1967, Edward Lamb of the Edward Lamb Foundation, Toledo, Ohio, donated some stock to SCLC, which had a market value of $6,000. Edward Lamb is a well-known successful businessman in Toledo, Ohio. It was learned in November 1967 that the Ford Foundation was about to give SCLC $230,000. This money was to train Negro ministers in 25 cities throughout the nation to become qualified leaders in the ghetto areas. Subtitle Funds from Individuals In October 1965, Governor of New York Nelson Rockefeller matched the $25,000 donation which King made to the Gandhi Society for Human Rights, another fundraising adjunct of SCLC. In February 1967, it was learned that Harry Belafonte, well-known entertainer, performed on a television program in Paris, France, for the benefit of SCLC, as a result, SCLC was to receive $10,000. In the year 1967, Anne Lebouzet Farnsworth, also known as Mrs. Peter Farnsworth, an heiress to the Clark Thread fortune, donated $50,000 to SCLC. In January 1968, it was learned she was in the process of donating $100,000 to King's Group. Subtitle, Funds from Government Agencies. In early December 1966, it was determined that King's organization was about to participate in a $4 million loan from the Federal Housing Administration because of SCLC's involvement in a slum clearance program in Chicago, Illinois. Under existing government regulations, SCLC would share in the 10% profit allowed of $400,000. Levinson made available $12,500 of his own money so that SCLC could participate in this program and share in its profits. It was also determined that in November 1967, the Department of Labor negotiated a contract with SCLC to train Negroes for employment in Atlanta, Georgia. Of the $61,000 involved in the contract, $13,000 went to SCLC and $48,000 went to the grocers in Atlanta for providing on-the-job training for previously unemployed Negroes. Subtitle, Funds for Washington Spring Project. In February 1968, Levison was in conference with one of King's aides concerning methods of raising funds for the Washington Spring Project. Levison suggested that a meeting be held in the home of Harry Belafonte of approximately 60 individuals who have contributed $1,000 or more to SCLC in the past. Levison advised that some of the people to be invited to this meeting would be Governor and Mrs. Nelson Rockefeller, Mary and Stephen Rockefeller, and Franklin D. Roosevelt III. In early March 1968, Levison was continuing his efforts to raise funds for the Washington Spring Project. He was quite pleased with his current results and notified Clarence Jones that he has sent out a mailing to 80,000 individuals who have contributed to King's organization in the past two years, soliciting funds. Levison remarked that 
the returns were running ahead of last year's response with 15,000 being received in one day. This is the end of section five. Section six, King's personal conduct. With the funds he had received from the Ford Foundation, King held the first of two workshops in Miami, Florida in February 1968 to train Negro ministers in urban leadership. One Negro minister in attendance later expressed his disgust with the behind the scenes drinking, fornication, and homosexuality that had went on at the conference. Several Negro and white prostitutes were brought in from the Miami area. An all night sex orgy was held with these prostitutes and some of the delegates in attendance. One room had a large table in it which was filled with whiskey. The two Negro prostitutes were paid $50 to put on a sex show for the entertainment of guests. A variety of sex acts deviating from the normal were observed. Subtitle Previous Sexual Experiences This activity is not new to King and his associates. As early as January 1964, King engaged in another two-day drunken sex orgy in Washington, D.C. Many of those present engaged in sexual acts, natural as well as unnatural, for the entertainment of onlookers. When one of the females shed away from engaging in an unnatural act, King and others of the male, males present discussed how she would be taught and initiated in this respect. Throughout the ensuing years and until this day, King has continued to carry on his sexual aberrations secretly while holding himself out to public view as a moral leader of religious conviction. Subtitle King's Mistress It was learned in February 1968 from a very responsible Los Angeles individual in a position to know that King has been having an illicit love affair with the wife of a prominent Negro dentist in Los Angeles, California, since 1962. He believes King fathered a baby girl to this woman in as much as her husband is allegedly sterile. The child resembles King to a great degree and King contributes to the support of this child. He calls this woman every Wednesday and frequently meets her in various cities throughout the country. The individual who reported this is himself a prominent Negro who is related to law to King's mistress. He advised he has known King since 1960 and refers to him as a hypocrite. He also reported that King is having illicit love affairs with three other women, one of whom is Joan Bays, the national, nationally known folk singer. The prominent Negro who furnished information said he was appalled that a man of King's low character could cause so much trouble for both Negroes and the government. As can be seen from the above, it is a fact that King not only regularly indulges in adulterous acts, but enjoys the abnormal by engaging in group sexual orgies. Subtitle King's Historical Aspect these facts about the Nobel Peace Prize winner makes his remarks seem incongruous when he replied about winning this cherished award. History has thrust me into this position. It would both be immoral and a sign of ingratitude if I did not face my moral responsibility to do what I can in the civil rights struggle. Hey, thanks for taking the time to watch the video. Please be sure to like the video, comment, subscribe to the channel, and share it with others. Ultimately, I found this article to be very revelatory, and it pretty much confirms that everybody that we pretty much look up to, they are human beings, and you cannot pedestalize human beings because basically all you're doing is you're setting yourself up for failure. We all have sin, we all have our downfalls, but you're supposed to look at the motives and the reasons behind what people do and their legacy is that the betterment of a people the ultimate betterment of everybody in the country but also in the world hopefully that's something that you all actually got from this but hey thank you